I'm going to act out the video I was going to show you. It's about a UFC fighter. It really is, but I'm not really going to act it out. So it's amazing how quickly we get distracted by the smallest things. Eh? But God's not distracted. God is purposeful in what he's about, and he is doing what he's doing. For that purpose series, what it is, it's a, it's a six-week series that we're doing on um, you know, that, that uh, what is our purpose, essentially? And we have a general purpose and a specific purpose. But what is the purpose of us being here? God doesn't just make us beautiful and wonderful and then just so that we're like ornaments on His shelf that He can look at. We have a purpose. We have something that we're meant to be doing and something that we're made for. Now, every tool in a, in a toolbox or in your garage or something has a certain purpose. If you go fishing, there are different lures for different fish. Each lure or each hook has a different purpose that it's meant to fulfill. And so we are the same. We are made with a purpose in mind. And so we're going to look at what that is in a, in the, in a six-week series that's going to start on the 5th of Feb. It's going to start there. And so what we'll do is there'll be a Sunday. Then on the Tuesday, there'll be small groups that meet in various places and online. And those will have their own little video and a follow-up thing. There's a booklet that goes with it. So it's a 36-day devotional. So each day of the six weeks, uh, six days of the six weeks, is a daily devotional, and then there's space in there for notes on the Sunday and space for notes from the Tuesday fill-in stuff. So what we need from you, we've ordered some of those books, but we need you just to sign up. There's no cost involved. We just need you to sign up so that we know uh, who needs a book and who's going to be here and if, uh, which, which small group you need to be connected to. So we're going to send out on the WhatsApp group, we're going to send out a, a link to a Google Docs form, and you can just click that on your phone and it'll open up or on your computer or iPad or whatever, and you can fill out that form and it sends it off and we get the response and we'll know from there. So that's all we need. If you're not going to be here for one or two Sundays, it doesn't matter. Stick it out. Come and be a part of it. Get involved. The, the videos are always available on our YouTube channel. And so we really want, really want to encourage you. It's a, it's a brilliant series. It's done by City Hill again. And um, so they are incredibly generous with their resources and with what they've provided. So we will be running that from the 5th until the second to last week of the term, roughly. So around there. So that starts in two weeks' time. So sign up. It'll be going out this week. All right. So the, um, the amazing slide that my wife made is also not up there. But, you know, one of our, one of our biggest purposes is to know Jesus and to make him known. And, and I think that captures very well the essence of our faith and of our Christianity. And last week we spoke a fair bit about knowing Jesus and the importance of that. And, and this week, our, the, the title of my um, sermon, if you're looking for one, was to make him known. So to make Jesus known. And it was uh, the video that I was going to show you was a, a video of Yoel Romero. And for those who are UFC or MMA followers, he was a, a, a heavyweight champion, I think, or he was like a midweight or something. Anyway, he was one of the bigger guys, but he was a, a champ a few years ago. So it was about the video itself was from seven years ago. So he had won the fight and he had just won the biggest fight of his career. And so they, they interviewed the fighters in the ring afterwards. And um, I think he's a Brazilian. And uh, he was wearing a, a, like a sweatband, like a 1980s tennis sweatband that said John 316 on it. And so he goes into this tirade about America. And he's, he's got quite a heavy accent, but he says, wake up, America, wake up. You've gone. You've lost it. You've forgotten. You've forgotten the most important thing. Jesus is the biggest and the greatest. Get back. Go back to Jesus. You've lost him. Go back to following Jesus on this amazing stage, this, this mass. And so there was, out of that, there was this whole social media storm, and he's abusing America, and he's telling him. And so people mistook it and took it wrong. And then they, the, the second part of the video was them interviewing a guy called Dana White. So Dana White is the, effectively the CEO of UFC. So he's the boss of all the fighters. He's in charge. He's a, quite an influential guy in the whole scene. And so this chap is, influ, is interviewing Dana White a few days later. And Dana White's response is like, listen, you know, there's nothing wrong. I don't think there was anything controversial. He didn't say what people are saying he said. But he said, you know, that, that Jesus stuff, just keep it at home. You've just won the biggest fight of your career. Like, people don't want to hear about Jesus. Tell them about the fight. Like, people don't want to be preached to. Just leave that stuff. Religion and politics and all that stuff, leave that stuff at home. And so my title was going to, I had a, like, I've got a whole number of titles, but it's to make him known. And it's preached, and it's, the, the picture was this megaphone. And we're going to read quite a few passages out of Acts chapter 4 and 5. So if you could turn there with me, we're going to read out of uh, the book of Acts chapters 4 and 5. I'm going to jump around a lot, but I'll tell you where I'm going. 
And this thing that, and it just struck me how, how overt Dana White was on just being like, hey, listen, we love you. We, we, like, we love the fight. We enjoy that. We want to see you beat the pants off each other. But just, like, don't tell us what you believe. Like, just that stuff, like, please, we, we're not interested in that. We just want the entertainment. We don't want the, the other stuff that comes with it. Like, you, that's, a, that's a private thing. You keep that at home. And, and friends, if we're honest, the world loves people who do good things. But they're just going like, man, that stuff, just keep that stuff at home. We, we don't want to know about that. Like, we just, do your good thing. Now, can we, there's nothing wrong with that. But don't tell us about Jesus. And so, this morning, I just want to look at a few of those um, a few verses out of Acts 4 and 5 and see that what we are facing in that is not a new phenomenon. What we are facing in that statement is not something that no one else has faced. So we're going to start from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. We're going to, let's start at verse 1 and I'll tell you where we go from there. So the priests... And Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. So Peter and John in Acts 3, you're going to have a look back. They've just healed this chap. They've gone into the, into the temple for prayer, and they've seen this guy who's sitting there every day, a cripple, and he's begging for money. And they say, man, we don't have money, but what I do have is healing. Get up in the name of Jesus. And so this guy suddenly gets up. Legs healed, knows how to walk. I think that's, there's two miracles. One is that his body's healed, but the other one is that he learns how to walk instantly. It's incredible. Anyway, and so they get called up before the Sanhedrin. So Acts 4, verse 1, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. And it's such an interesting thing that I was listening to a podcast by um, Tim Keller a while ago. And he said, Jesus has this amazing juxtaposition of reactions. When he preaches and when, he's, when, he's, when he is active and, and when he's around, is this, this amazing attraction to Jesus. So all of these people are like, man, this guy got healed. What's going on? And these, they, they come and they see and they want to know what's going on. But then on the other side of that, he's highly offensive. Is that people get miffed when Jesus is active. They, they get upset about things that he does. And it's so, it's like we love this part, but not that part. And, and so Jesus has this amazing juxtaposition of reactions to him. So let's jump down to verse 7, a little bit further down. So these, um, the, the Sanhedrins or the, the Sadducees and the, the guys, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked he, how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Jump down to verse 17. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, so this is now the Sanhedrin talking amongst themselves, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again. So the Sanhedrin calls Peter and John in and again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And it's interesting. They did not say, I don't want you to heal anybody. They didn't say, we don't want you to look after the poor. They said, do what you like. Just don't speak about Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Jump down to 31. Peter and John then go back to the rest of the disciples. They meet up with them. They tell them what's happened. They rejoice. They're praying. And verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Can you say boldly? boldly. Can you say it boldly? boldly. Oh, there we go. Turn over to um, chapter 5. A couple of, maybe a page over or two. Chapters, uh, chapter 5, verse 16. 
Second half of verse 16. Well, um, they've gone on. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick, those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. All of them. Can you say all of them? All of them. them. Down to verse 27. I know we're jumping around, but it's good. So the apostles were brought in again. So so they've like they've they've carried on. They haven't stopped. And so they're going on. And now these people. Now there's like a lot of people getting healed and exercised and all sorts of stuff. And so they get brought in again in front of the, the the Sanhedrin. So the apostles are brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. <clears throat> and he says this to them. He says, "Hey, we gave you strict orders." The the hey is paraphrasing. We gave you strict <laughs> orders not to teach in this name. And he said, "Yet." You have filled Jerusalem with this teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Jump down to verse 40. Close to the end. Last, last three verses of chapter 5. Peter and, Peter and John then give this amazing um, they give this amazing testimony and this amazing speech about, it's kind of like the first um, sermon. And then Gamaliel, one of the Pharisees, stands up and he says, hey, listen, guys, like we don't have to actually pick a fight here. We've seen before when these uprisings happened and we killed this guy and then his followers went away. So if this is from God, you're only going to fight against God. If this is not from God, it'll dissipate and go away. That was one of the Pharisees who were like, they were one of the Sanhedrin. And so... It says there from verse 40, his speech, that's Gamaliel's speech, persuaded them. So they, the Sanhedrin, called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, flogging, uh, if you know anything about floggings, they're not, it's not like a, a rap on the knuckles. It's like strip you bare and beat you with a cat of nine tails from somebody who's very experienced in, in doing it. And so it would have been cuts on the back, blood. It wasn't a comfortable, easy thing. We read it and we're like, yeah, that was bad, but it would have ta- it was a process. It would have probably taken an hour or so in that little thing that went on there, one after the other, just getting a flogging. And then they said, right, so you haven't listened. We agree. We're not going to fight against you. We're just going to flog you quickly. And then we're going to tell you, like, don't speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. Again, do you see, they're not upset by what they're doing. They're not saying, we don't want you to heal people. We don't want you to cleanse people of impure spirits. We don't want you to... We do not speak in the name of Jesus. You're not listening. We're going to give you a beating. And we're going to tell you again, don't do it. (laughs) Verse 41, and this is the appropriate response. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. I don't know that there's anything more challenging this morning than that verse. How many of us celebrate Count it a blessing when we are suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Negative reinforcement does not work. They just were like, we're going to carry on. They just were not going to be stopped preaching the name of Jesus. You see, they... They weren't upset even that this movement was gathering members. They weren't upset about the actions they were doing. They weren't upset that people were joining them. They were upset that they were preaching in the name of Jesus. We love your good works. We love what you're doing. But please just leave the Jesus stuff out of it. Just do it quietly. Keep that to yourself. Almost like Gandalf to Frodo. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. Lord of the Rings, nobody? Just the three of us. Okay. (laughs) They just, it's like, just keep it inside. We don't, we don't want to know about that thing. Just hold on to it. And Peter and John have this amazing response twice. They say the same thing. They say, you choose who it's better for us to obey. You or God? It sounds like an incredibly arrogant thing to say. And it can be, depending on your heart and the context. And you've got to be sure you're hearing God on those things. But friends, that is our challenge, is who do we choose to obey? We cannot help speaking about what we heard. Acts chapter 4, verse 20. That is their motivation. That is the reason that they, they're like, they, they feel this compulsion to continue to preach. They're like, we can't help it. I can't tell people like we're not doing anything. I can't. It's not about the good works. 
It's not about the healing. It's not about the exorcisms. That's not the main thing. See, the world wants to make the actions, the, the outward thing, the, the, the showy thing, the, the, the actual thing that we can see, they want to make that the main thing. They say, that's the important thing. But it's not. See, Peter and John and the apostles, what they knew was that it was about Jesus. That those things were simply signs of who Jesus truly is. Those things were a picture of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in those moments. The authority of the king coming in and saying, sickness and the results of sin cannot be where Jesus is. That's why there were exorcisms. That's why there were healings. It's so that we can see that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Those things weren't an entertainment attraction to draw crowds. They had that result, but that's not the point of them. The point is so that we can see who Jesus truly is in those moments. We cannot help speaking about what we have heard. Do we have that? Do we carry that? Do we carry that where we're like, man, I cannot help but say Jesus about everything that is in my life. Do we have that? Or, or are we ascribing a lot of the goodness and the things that happen in our lives to maybe your own skill, your own entrepreneurial spirit, your own whatever it might be? Or is it, I cannot help but speak about Jesus? Does it just come out of you? Does it flow out of you? If not, we're going to look at why. But there's a story of Charlie, a, a man named Charlie Pierce, and, a, and it's from a, a preacher and a writer, Leonard Ravenhill. And he tells the story of Charlie Pierce, who was a man on death row. And he was going to, the, to the, his final moment of execution. And as he's walking along, there was a, a minister there who was reading kind of the final rites. He was reading scripture and, and the final thing. And, and, and Charlie Pierce, hearing this preacher and, and obviously knowing a little bit about the Christian faith, he says to this, he says to this preacher, well, this minister, he says, Sir, addressing the preacher, this is Charlie Pierce, the, the criminal speaking. He said, If I believed what you and the church of God say that you believe, even if England were covered with broken glass from coast to coast, I would walk over it, if needs be, on hands and knees and think it worthwhile living just to save one soul from an eternal hell like that. Walk across England on broken glass just to save just to tell one person about the gospel. Do we have that compulsion in us? Or are we just scared of what the person in the line at Spa is going to think of us if we say, hey, Jesus loves you and so do I. Do we have that kind of desperation where the gospel is such good news to us that we cannot help but blurt it out in every situation? Not the latest wisdom or the Google-derived answer of what's my purpose or where should I live or... Uh, shall I emigrate? But the gospel of Jesus, such good news, such, such, a, such a living thing for us where it's, where it's so real and fresh in us that it cannot but come out. But you see what this takes, and, and, and it's amazing that Peter and John have this. So we miss it sometimes because we don't live in such a layered society of shame and guilt and authority. But in their society, the Sanhedrin, so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawmakers, in Jewish society, they had ultimate control over life and death. And the, the community was the be-all and the end-all of society. And if you were excluded from community, it means no one would do business with you. It means you weren't invited to weddings. You weren't included in social functions. You were, you were literally ostracized from life in itself. And you were, you were cut off from every sort of functioning of society. And it, was, it wasn't like us where you just had other choices. You could just move to another city and carry on. It was... It was life-threatening to have that happen to you in those times. And so these, Peter and, and John and the apostles, they, they weren't politically and religiously influential in their time. And the, the Sanhedrins and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were incredibly powerful people in their society. And so they call them in and they tell them, hey, listen, you just need to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John, and, and they just say, no, we're not going to. And that takes an immense amount of courage. Make no bones about it. They, they, they weren't just flippantly like, oh, well, you can't tell me what to do. We've got free speech and the Third Amendment and the Fourth This and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. There were none of that. It was like, if you don't stop, we're going to kill you. Nobody gonna, there's no repercussions here. It's like, off with your head, you're done. And we'll, ostr we'll ostracize your families as well. Like, you, your whole lineage will be cut off. This is, it was very serious for them what they did when they went in and when they carried on speaking in the name of Jesus. We need to gra grasp the weight of that thing because it takes an immense amount of courage to be able to be so bold 
as to carry on in the face of that kind of opposition. So where does this courage come from? And we read it in there. There's a clue in there. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. You can turn back one page. But courage comes from one place and one place only, this kind of courage. It comes from time with Jesus. Acts 4, 13. When they, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. How many of us here are unschooled, ordinary men and women? All of us. That's us, friends. We are unschooled, ordinary people. The Sanhedrin, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It's incredible. They had seen in these guys' lives. They said there's something in them. They, like, they haven't got any academic study. They're not, like, they're not from upper echelon families. What is it? And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That is where their courage to preach the gospel boldly and defiantly comes from. Time with Jesus. There is no substitute for time with Jesus. There is no substitute for a relationship with Jesus. We can drum up all the courage we may find in ourselves or think we have to try and go out and boldly share the gospel and go to the nations and drive across Africa. But true courage comes from time with Jesus. That thing, when you look at someone, I remember, and I've said it over and over and over again, and I'm going to say it again today because it's a great example. When I met Kirst, there was something, I could see something in her that I knew I wanted. There was something in her eyes, and I didn't know what it was. And I'm like, man, what is that thing? It turns out it's Jesus. I didn't know it at the time, but it was so desirable to me. That is the thing. That when we're going to meet people, we're going to speak to people. It's time with Jesus that gives what we say weight. It gives it spiritual authority. We can have all the knowledge and the right arguments and the right things, and we can know the Bible, but without that relationship and that time with Jesus, it's hollow and it's empty, and it just... You're like, man, why is this not working? Like, why? Tell you what, instead of preaching so much and going out so much, go and spend time with Jesus first. Go and be with him first. Out of that place, you'll minister in a way that is bold and courageous. You see, because in his presence, we find, we, we find who we are. The gifted series comes from, you, you want to know what your gifts are? Go and be with Jesus and you'll find out. He speaks identity over us, who we are. This is who I've called you to be, my son, my daughter. Before we do anything, he speaks identity over us. He gives us our purpose. In his presence, we discover that we are truly free. This is why Peter and John could do this. Because they had discovered in the presence of Jesus that nothing else mattered nearly as much as him. Everything that we think is important and we look after, and it's not wrong to cultivate those things and to, you know, to, to look after your family and to look after, you know, plan for retirement. and all. Those are good things. But those things shouldn't carry more weight than your relationship with Jesus. Those things shouldn't carry more weight than the, the time you spend with Jesus. They should not carry more weight in your life and importance in your life than what Jesus calls you to do. When we are in his presence, we are encouraged and emboldened to do what we thought we never would be able to do. In his presence, we are set free from the concerns and the worries of this life. Our focus is, turned, is tuned to the eternal reality and the promise that we have in Jesus. You see, a lot of the time, the things that worry us and that hold us back from doing something, that hold us back from taking the next step, are concerns about this life. They're concerns about what are people going to think of me? Am I going to be in this? Am I going to be not invited to the next thing because they don't want to hear about Jesus again? And then that Yol Romero, he could have, and he didn't shut up about Jesus, old Yol Romero. Because, but he could have thought, like, man, this, is, this guy like, can decide my career. He can decide who am I going to fight against next? How much am I going to pay? Am I going to have a career? But he knew that there was something far more important. There was an eternal promise in Jesus. And so that for us, when we spend time with Jesus, when we are with Jesus, when we know him, out of that place we can make him known. To be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, to do what he did. Know him and make him known. That is our calling. That is what we need to do. Do not let the world tell you to pop down and be quiet. 
I got, one of the, I got one of the best jobs in the world. Where someone says, hey, listen, you're getting a little preachy. I say, thank you. <laughs> but don't, friends, like people say, like, don't, you know, one of the things that Dana White says in the end of that, in that little clip, he says, people don't want to be preached to. And I'm like, well, sorry. I do a lot of things that people don't want. That's not the point. Whom are we going to obey? Are we, is it better to obey people? Or is it better to obey God? Because God says that faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. It says, go out and preach to all the nations, making disciples of Jesus, teaching them, teaching them, baptizing them. We've got it with our words, friends. Our actions are important. We need that. We need to love on people and demonstrate our actions need to line up with our words. But we can never be afraid to preach the gospel boldly and with courage. With courage. Out of, a presence, out of the presence of Jesus. Don't ever let the world tell you your faith belongs at home. Keep it private. Please don't bring that stuff into the, into the workplace. You are, I can't not because that's who I am. Part of that means that I'm a love, I live with integrity and I'm honest and my yes is my yes and my no is my no. So you want all that part, but you don't want to know where it comes from. If you want that part, it comes with this. You get the whole package. Never be afraid to preach the gospel wherever you go. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would make us bold and you would give us courage and that you would give us a fearlessness to preach your gospel wherever we go, Jesus. That we would have the boldness to make you known, Jesus, in every situation that we're in, in every forum that we um, enter into. And Jesus, I pray that, that out of that place of being in your presence, that you would lead us and guide us, that you would lead us and guide us daily to be, in a, um, to be in places where people are ready and ripe to hear the gospel, Lord. They're ready to hear the good news of your, sal- your salvation that comes through faith in you, Jesus. I pray that you give us um, the words to say, Holy Spirit, as you promised, that we need not worry in, in certain situations because you will give us the very words we need to speak. I pray that you would give us that reminder, Holy Spirit, that we need to be in the presence of Jesus before we begin to preach about Jesus. So help us, God, to know Jesus and to make him known to this world that we live in. Amen. Amen.